So a mouse and ass and a cheese-eating goblin walk into a bar. It must be day four of Wild of Elder Raid spoilers. Hello everyone, it's Seth, probably better known as Ephrata Live, and it's time for another daily dose of Wilds of Eldorade spoilers. So we've made it today for a spoiler season, and we have some good stuff today. Some stuff that's pretty much guaranteed to be really good in standard, some cool commander cards, and a bunch of just really wonky creature types and interesting stuff, which means we should probably jump right into it, start talking sweet new Wilds of Eldorade cards. Before we do, two quick reminders. First, if you need any of these cards, you can snag them from our sponsor, Card Kingdom, over at cardkingdom.com slash mtggoldfish. Second, to keep up on all the latest spoilers throughout the day, you should head on over to mtgpreviews.com. Anyway, let's talk some Wilds of Eldorade. First up today, we have one of the best standard cards and one of the best aggro cards we've seen from Wilds of Eldorade so far in Charming Scoundrel. So Charming Scoundrel, this card's kind of ridiculous, a 2 mana 1-1 one, one with haste, it's a red human rogue. When it ETBs, you get three options. Discard a card, then draw a card, create a treasure token, or create a wicked roll token, attach a target creature you control. So if you think about what the wicked roll is, that's the one that gives plus one plus one and then when the aura dies or i guess that if the creature dies or would also die one damage to each opponent so what this means is charming scoundrel base level two mana two two haste that when it or the aura on it dies you're able to deal an extra damage to your opponent that by itself is a standard staple card. If you look through the recent history of standard, two mana 2-2 two, two hasters with upside are kind of staples. Felden or Anam Excavator, currently like a four of staple in mono red decks, is even legendary, it can't block. Bloodthirsty Adversary, staple in standard. Robber of the Rich, one of the best cards in its standard format. If you want to go way back in time, Ash Zealot, even though its ability was rarely relevant, was kind of a standard staple just because it was a two mana 2-2 two, two first strike haster. So I think just Charming Scoundrel, with only the Wicked Roll option, is already a four of standard card in mono red aggro style decks and charming scoundrel is actually way more than that i think so that's the base mode i think a huge percentage of the time you just cast this as a two mana two two haster if it dies you get an extra damage start smashing your opponent but it's also a wily goblin and wily goblins a card that we played many times in the past it's definitely not a staple but a two mana one one that makes a treasure is not a horrible card and even in standard i think there's times when this is an option you choose there's going to be times when you have a really nice four drop in hand like a Koth Fire of Resistance or an Itsushi Blazing Sky so rather than get in as much aggro damage as possible with Charming Scoundrel instead you play it on two you make the treasure ramp into your four drop a turn earlier that's really powerful and then it's also kind of like a weird scrap work mutt and we've seen scrap work mutt be good in like graveyard reanimator style decks you're trying to get your portal to Phyrexia in the graveyard so you can reanimate it maybe in standard you're just putting Tenacious Underdog in the graveyard so you can blitz it Charming Scoundrel does that as well and it even has a sneaky upside if you read scrap work mutt it says when it enters the battlefield you may discard a card if you do draw a card charming scoundrels worded a bit differently it just says discard a card then draw a card so what this means in practice is if you're empty-handed which is a thing that happens to mono red aggro decks you can play this choose the discard a card draw a card mode and the end result will be you just straight up draw a card because you have nothing to discard the drawing is not dependent on the discarding so you would just generate random card advantage from it so when you add all that together this card seems like a really really strong standard aggro card and it could even have some implications outside of standard like maybe humans it does have the human creature type but uh, rogue i don't know if red rogues actually matters i guess rogues could go into grixis but maybe there's a champion of the parish thalia's lieutenant boros aggro style human deck in historic or in modern we've also seen stuff like wily goblin show up in aggro decks goblin decks maybe this could show up in some sort of like eight whack reckless bushwhacker boros beatdown style deck in a format like pioneer it gets stuff like crocs in the graveyard so when you add all this together charming scoundrel is a card that looks like it's designed to be very good in 60 card formats I would be floored if this was not a standard staple. I do not see a way that this card cannot be a four of auto include in red aggro decks in standard. I guess the only way it doesn't work out is if red aggro just doesn't exist because shoulders everywhere and you just can't play red aggro. But assuming there's a red aggro deck, this is one of the first cards you add in as a four of every single time. That's how good it is. And I think it has some chance to show up in formats like Pioneer and maybe if you're really squint hard enough modern as well. 
Speaking of red two drops, we also got one that is <clears throat> not quite as exciting in a raging battle mouse. So raging battle mouse, two mana to one. It says when you cast your second spell each turn, it costs one less to cast, and then it has celebration where the beginning of combat on your turn. If two or more nine land permanents enter the battlefield under your control, target creature you control gets plus one plus one until end of turn. This card to me feels like something weird happened. Either like it was really pushed and Wizards nerfed it at the last minute. Maybe they took another card out of the set and this was like an uncommon and they bumped it up to rare at the last minute. This card just looks really bad to me. And like doubly so since we were just talking about Charming Scoundrel, which is like such an amazing red two drop for constructed formats. Raging Battle Mouse leaves a lot to be desired. I guess like, yes, it can kind of ramp you sometimes in narrow situations. Yes, I guess it can get an extra damage with Celebration, but it is hard for me to see a reason that I would put this in my deck. The only thing I will say about Raging Battle Mouse is we do know we're going to that like human animal world next year so maybe this is like a plant for the future and we're gonna have like a busted mouse tribal deck in like six months from now or a year from now we're gonna be like oh raging battle mouse it's like absurd in mouse tribal because of however mice work in magic but for now i would say if you're thinking about playing raging battle mouse just don't and play Charming Scoundrel instead. But uh, I don't know, how high of a bar can we really set for Mice and Magic? They're not the most powerful creature, so I guess maybe it's a flavor win at least. On the other hand, we have a white four drop that I actually really like a lot for certain decks in Archon of the Wild Rose. So four mana four, four with flying, it's an Archon. It says other creatures you control that are enchanted by auras you control have base power and toughness of four, four and have flying. So Archon of the Wild Rose, this card seems designed to power up the role mechanic essentially work with stuff like area at term scoundrel conceded we have ch so we're going to this standard thanks to wilds of Eldrain, where we're going to have these role auras that are not very powerful but they're very plentiful there's a lot of cards that just like kind of accidentally put an aura on things so what i'm envisioning is you're playing a role deck where you're playing like charming scoundrel that's putting a role on stuff conceded which whatever the good role cards are and then archon's kind of your finisher you'd like drop this down and suddenly your charming scoundrel is a 4-4, plus it's got the roll on it, so it's actually a 5-5, five, five, and it goes to the air, and you just smash your opponent to death. Like, imagine a curve of one drop that makes a roll, two drop that makes a roll, three drop that makes a roll, our kind of wild rows. You're pretty much just killing your opponent. You're hitting for, like, 12 in the air the turn that Archon comes down at a minimum, and probably even more than that because of the auras and the power of your creatures. So I think that Archon of the Wild Rose actually has the potential to be really, really strong, specifically in a roll-style aura deck. I don't know if it has any homes outside of that. Like, you could play it in some, like, Light Paws, Audacity deck, but the weird thing about Archon of the Wild Rose is it's a go wide auras card. Traditionally in Magic, most of the aura decks we've seen are go tall decks where you're trying to like play a single slippery boggle and put a ton of auras on them. You play a single light pause and put a ton of auras on it. Archon of the Wild Rose just isn't that impactful in a deck like that. If you only have one or two creatures with auras, like yeah, it's nice that your light pause gets plus two power, I guess, but that's really not worth it for a four drop in a deck that really wants to be aggressive. So you need to be a go wide or a deck which is mostly i think the role archetype i could imagine some commander decks wanting it but even there like most of the aura decks you see are go tall voltron style decks ural or light paws but it does seem really sweet in like siona siona is like kind of go wide because it's putting auras on things and making one ones calyx can be built in a go wide way so if you're playing an aura deck that's not about making one creature really really big but making a bunch of creatures with auras on them then i think archon of the wild rose is kind of an absurd finisher and i gotta say i really love the design of this card this is what i want to see more of so i want to see less shieldreds which is just like the best four drop in every archetype and i want to see more archon of the wild roses which is a pretty medium to bad four drop in a lot of archetypes like a four mana four four flyer is fine but if you're not taking advantage of its ability you're really not going to put it in your deck but in the right deck in that roll deck this is better than shield red like if you're going to go turn one or on a creature turn two turn three play this that's a legit scary game ending threat so i hope we see more designs in this direction where we see really really push powerful cards but they only go in a specific archetype unless just generically good mid-range shield red fable the mirror 
Nightmare Breaker style cards, which have caused a lot of problems in Standard over the last year or so, where you just see the same cards over and over and over again because they're the best in every single archetype. So well done to Wizards on Archon of the Wild Rose. I expect this is going to be a card that shows up in like 5% of decks or something, but in that 5% of decks, it's going to be one of the best cards in best finishers possible. We got one Mythic today, and it is a pretty interesting one in Asinine Antic. So it's a four mana blue sorcery, except you can cast it as if it had flash if you pay two more mana. So six mana instant speed. And it says for each creature your opponents control, create a cursed roll token attached to that creature. And the cursed roll, that's the one you normally don't want on your stuff. It turns a creature into a one one. So Asinine Antics, I'm very intrigued by this card. You can make an argument that this is as close as Blue has gotten to having an actual Wrath of God, or I guess technically a route since you can cast an instant speed for two more mana. So for Commander, this is kind of a Blue Wrath. Obviously, there's some drawbacks here. The creatures are still on the battlefield. They don't lose any of their abilities, so you're still getting drained by Shieldred or a Blood Artist or whatever. But still, this is a way that you can turn all of your opponent's creatures from whatever they are into to relatively harmless 1-1s, one -ones, which for a color like blue that doesn't actually get hard wrath is actually kind of appealing. So as far as blue wraths go, this is kind of an intriguing option. I think comparison, so we have Curse of Swine. The problem with Curse of Swine is it's really expensive. It essentially turns all of your opponent's creatures into two, two green boars. The upside of Curse of Swine is it actually exiles the creatures and replaces them with tokens. So the abilities are gone as well. But if you want to get rid of a big board of creatures with Curse of Swine, it's really, really pricey because it's double blue and X. Plus, you can only ever do it at sorcery speed. Another comparison is Mass Diminish, which is a card I forgot existed because I've never actually seen anyone play it. It's like a permanent Mass Diminish. Mass Diminish just turns creatures target player controls into one ones until the next turn. Asinine Antics essentially does that for all your opponent's creatures forever, so it seems way better than Mass Diminish. Plus, the big upside here is Asinine Antics as an instant can do some cool things during combat. So you can like wait and swing, and once your opponent blocks your stuff, turn all of your opponent's things into one ones, kill all their stuff. You can even use it with opponents attacking each other. Like one opponent attacks another opponent, there's a bunch of blocks, you cast this, everything's one ones, kind of wipe out the board that way. In that sense, the instant speed aspect reminds me a little bit of sudden spoiling kind of yes you don't lose the abilities which is one of the big drawbacks but still some big blowouts possible during combat so is this a blue staple in commander i'm gonna go with no so I think the card is good, but I think this is a card that I would mostly play in specific decks. And the decks that I would wanna play this in is decks that also have enchantment synergies. So you can turn this into like a hard wrath with Curse of Deathhold or Knight of Souls Betrayal, but then you're in black, so just play a Damnation or whatever. The intriguing part about this is this puts an enchantment that you control on the battlefield for every creature your opponents control. So yes, you're getting this weird like pseudo wrath upside, but but imagine you're playing a deck that actually cares about having lots of enchantments. Maybe you have a Sanctum Weaver, which makes mana equal number of enchantments you control. Asinine Antics is probably an absurd ritual in that context. If your opponents have 10 creatures, you cast this for four, then your Sanctum Weaver is going to tap for 10 extra mana. That's ridiculous. Or maybe you have Sphere of Safety. Then you're kind of turning it into a Hard Wrath as well. Your opponent's just not going to be able to attack you because you have a ton of enchantments on the battlefield. Maybe you're trying to win with Destiny Spinner, which makes creatures equal to the power and toughness of the number of enchantments you control so in those contexts this card is ridiculous and it gets even better the best use of this card is going to be constellation decks because constellation it just cares about enchantments entering the battlefield so go back to that scenario where you're playing a game of commander and between your three opponents they have 10 creatures on the battlefield which is not at all unrealistic in commander there's going to be times when your opponents have 30 creatures 50 creatures on the battlefield so 10 creatures not unrealistic so your opponent has 10 creatures you cast your ass nine annex that means your satessan champion or idol on blossoms is going to draw you 10 cards from all those auras entering the battlefield if you have a knight leia's colossus or a boon of the spirit realm your stuff's just going to get absurdly big you're going to kill everyone on the spot all your stuff's getting like plus 10 plus 10 with boon of the spirit realm all your opponent's stuff's one one what are they going to do about that you're going to make a ton of pegasus tokens with our kind of sun's grace so that's actually what i'm most hyped about so i think asinine antics is like an 
okay Wrath for Blue, but an absurd combo piece for enchantment decks. And we even have some of these synergies in standard. It might be more against the odds, but still like air yet drains on the end step equal to the number of ores you control. So if your opponent makes a big board and you turn them all in one ones with S9 antics, you're probably going to kill your opponent in a couple of turns with air yet. Hallowed Haunting just wants a ton of enchantments on the battlefield. Calyx has constellation, the one constellation card in standard. So you cast this, get a ton of counters on things. So S9 antics, I think the idea is for this to mostly be a commander card and why you can play it in any blue deck is like a pseudo wrath and it's going to be at its best if you can cast it at instant speed and get some of those in combat blowouts the ability for this to be a combo piece in constellation enchantment style decks is actually kind of ridiculous and in that context this card is downright busted we also got another member of the creature land cycle in restless spire so restless spire it's the is it creature land like the other ones etb is tapped it makes blue or red and then for a blue and a red you can turn it into a 2-1 blue and red elemental creature token with as long as it's your turn it has first strike and it's still land and when it attacks you get to scry one so restless buyer in some ways might be the best of the new creature lands just because it's the cheapest to activate actually i was thinking about old dual lands that turn into creatures and this might be the cheapest to activate that we've ever seen of a dual land creature land uh, so compared to something like wandering fumeral which was our last is it creature lad i think this is just better for constructed formats because the problem with wandering fumeral even though it can turn into like a relatively big creature four to activate is just kind of a big ask two to activate much more practical especially in aggressive style deck so I think restless buyer has a chance to be really good in standard actually I'm high on all the creature lands for standard I still think in standard uh, the creature lands are just inherently powerful especially in a long grindy standard format like we're in having a land that survives all the sunfalls and farewells and can come in and clean things up after all the removals done that's a really really powerful effect so I think like Jeskai controls the deck kind of on the fringes of the format restless buyer seems great there why would you not play four of them in a deck that's trying to be controlling and in the colors and it could also show up in aggro decks we have the pieces even though the deck is never really taken off but we have the pieces to build some sort of like is it spell slinger aggro deck for all and carries evs delvers monastery swift spears there's a lot of cards for it and that seems like a great addition there as well like sure it comes into play tapped you're gonna have to play off curve a little bit but in such a grindy standard i think that the upside of having this creature land that's cheap to activate cheap enough that in the late game you can realistically fire up two or three of these in a single turn and use them to close out the game the turn after your opponent farewelled away the entire board or whatever so i think restless spire really solid standard card i guess in commander you can try to play it for the scry matters thing we've been getting more support for like if you scry something cool happens like the temporal anchor or lost isle calling the problem is i was looking through the actual commanders that care about scrying and i don't think any of them are in the is it colors they're mostly simic or mono blue so i don't know what deck this would would actually fit in but keep that in mind the scry can be a little upside if your deck is built around scrying otherwise it's just a nice way to make sure you don't draw too many lands or whatever so restless buyer i think this is probably the best of the new creature lands we've seen so far great for standard probably not gonna make it in other formats even at only two to activate i think it's probably just too slow you just really don't want the tap land but we'll have to wait and see we also got a weird one in spiteful hex mage so spiteful hex mage one mana three two human warlock so starts off looking pretty good the problem is when it enters the battlefield you create a cursed roll token attached to a creature you control so the cursed roll that's the bad one that makes the creature a one one so if you play this on turn one you're not getting one mana three two you're getting a one mana one one thanks to the aura that you're gonna have to put on it so it's gonna be interesting to see how you can use this card this is another card that i think most decks aren't gonna want it's gonna be too hard to use because of that cursed roll that you have to put on your thing to show up in like mono black aggro or something like as a one mana one one in a generic deck it's just not good enough essentially you're turn defrogging your own creature permanently i guess you keep the abilities but still like that's not something you normally want to do there are dream scenarios especially in older formats where you're like turn one ornithopter spiteful hex mage haha my ornithopter is actually a one one now and i get a three two 
that doesn't actually seem like a very competitive plan, but that is a plan. That is something you could try to do. I think the power of this card is we have cards in standard that just care about auras being on the battlefield. The first one that came to mind was Lord Skitter's Blessing. Lord Skitter's Blessing wants to turn into a Phyrexian Arena, and it only costs two mana. The problem is you got to have an aura on a creature for it to work. Spiteful Hexmage curves really well into that. You play the Hexmage, sure, you got to curse it. It's going to be a 1-1, one, one, but it's also going to have an aura on it which means that you turn on your Lord Skitter's Blessing very early in the game. Could also be good in just an area deck where you're just like, okay, I want as many auras on the battlefield as possible. Will I play a one mana one one just because it adds an aura because then it's gonna start draining with my area or whatever. It's also fine with some creatures that don't really care about being a one one, like Champion of Flames, for example. It's already a one one, so sending its base power and toughness to one one doesn't really matter, but it gets plus two, plus two for each aura or equipment attached to it. So let's this is a one mana way to just add an aura to it and you're actually growing your champion of flames so you make more elemental tokens with velda or like core spirit and answer probably better as a one one than a zero two plus it grows for the auras attached to it so those synergies i think are what could make spiteful hex mage good so i don't think this is a generically good card but if you have a way to take advantage of the aura it could be worth it just because it's a really cheap way to get some auras and permanents on the battlefield moving into the world of artifacts we have hilda's Cry crown of winter so three mana legendary artifact you can pay one to tap target creature except it costs one less to cast if you activate it during your turn so during your turn it just taps to tap a creature and then you can pay three sacrifice it draw a card for each tap creature your opponent controls so first off i think this is just like a limited bomb like a tapper is going to remove a creature from combat every single turn and then later in the game you refill your hand and like draw a couple of cards three cards so i think limited this is like an absolute Absolute R star. In Constructed, this is going to be one of the best ways to make Hilda work, I think. We've talked before about Hilda and how its abilities are really, really strong. The problem is, to get those abilities, you got to be able to tap creatures, and most of the cards that tap creatures are just not very strong. This might be one of the best ways to actually make Hilda work. Like, you can play this, curve into Hilda, the following turn, tap something down for one mana, make a 4-4, four, four, grow your team, preordain, whatever. So if you're trying to make Hilda to work. I think this obviously as its name suggests is going to be one of the best cards in standard for your deck. It also does work as removal in standard. That same trick is in limited where for one mana every turn you tap down your opponent's best attacker. That does mostly work in constructed although it's a little hit or miss depending on the creature. Like against Shieldred this is really bad removal because you're still getting the static ability every turn. It's bad against ETB's ability. Like it's not going to stop Atroxa from ET being like a counter spell. On the other hand this is one mana never get attacked by Atroxa which seems kind of reasonable especially since you can cash it in for some card draw later I wouldn't play it in a generic deck but if my deck is like a Hilda deck and I'm intentionally trying to benefit from tapping stuff down then it's like an okay enough removal spell I think once you get to older formats or commander it gets a little bit more exciting obviously it works really well with Verity Circle double up your your card draw where you're tapping something with Hilda's crown drawing with Verity Circle and eventually sacking the crown to draw even more cards and plus, in older formats, tapping things down is just a lot easier. You got, you know, sagas like Time of Ice, stuff like Sleep can tap the entire team. And this could draw you a ton of cards. If you tap down your opponent's entire team and then sack this to draw cards, you could be refilling your entire hand depending on the board state. In Commander... I think it's mostly for Hilda decks, also going to be great in Rhoda and Tim Index. And there's some other commanders that are kind of built around tapping where this could be worth it. Like Abishin could just pay three mana, tap down all creatures without flying. This could potentially draw you a ridiculous number of cards. Like in the late game in a commander game, it's not unrealistic that your opponent's going to have 10 or more creatures. Hilda's Winter Crown is just drawing you 10 cards or something for a total of six mana. If you tap with the Abishin and then use it, Gadwick taps stiff down, Ojitai, the Add rare one tap stuff down so if your deck cares about tapping stuff down and it's going to do that consistently seems like a pretty neat option for your deck so hilda's crown of winter we'll have to wait and see for standard i'm going to try to make hilda work we'll see if it's actually a competitive thing it might not be but it seems like a really fun card and one of the best ways to support hilda we also got rotisserie elemental which Oh, I really want to like this card, but I don't. One mana, one, one elemental. It is Menace. When it deals combat damage to a player, you put a skewer counter on it. Then you can sack it. If you do, you exile the top cards of your library, the top X cards of your library, rather, where X is a number of counters on it. And then you can play those cards this turn. So, Rotisserie Elemental 
It looks like a bomb ant courier, and I love me some bonded courier. Bomb ant courier is actually like a really, really good card. And in some ways this is similar, right? It's a one drop that when it hits your opponent is gonna get counters and then eventually is gonna draw those cards, but it's missing a bunch of things that made bomb ant courier good. So I think this is like just the worst bomb ant courier ever to the point where I don't even know if it's playable, which makes me really sad because I want it to be. So compared to bomb ant courier, bomb ant courier has haste. So on turn one you're gonna get a card under it most likely rotisserie elemental does have menace which helps so you're not attacking with it on turn one but you're much more likely to be able to attack with it on turn two so that's kind of issue number one i think haste is just better than menace on this card issue number two is bomb at courier triggers when it attacks rotisserie elemental actually has to get in one of the tricks with bomb at courier is you can always draw one card with it like worst case you draw it off the top late game you play it you attack you exile the one card your opponent's got a bunch of blockers you just sack it and draw that card you got to discard your hand which is a drawback but still the fact that vomit courier essentially cycles off the top in the late game is something rotisserie elemental is not ever going to be able to do the downside of course of vomit courier is you do have to discard your hand so sometimes that's awkward rotisserie elemental doesn't have that but it doesn't refill your hand it only gives you the cards for a turn so all this to say I'm not sure if this card is good enough, even for standard. I could see an argument, like, if it's going to make it, it's going to be in, like, mono red. Is it better than, like, Falconrath Pit Fighter? Is it better than a Phoenix Chick? I don't know. How many cards do you have to be able to draw with this to make it worth it? Not many. Like, one or two is probably fine. The problem is, and here's the biggest problem that we didn't talk about before, the ability to sack it and draw those cards only happens when you hit your opponent. So let's say you play this on turn one. On turn two, you hit your opponent. You're feeling pretty good. You got your first counter. On turn three, you hit your opponent. You got two counters now. You're feeling really good. Turn four though, your opponent plays some blockers. You got these two counters. Bomb at Courier, you can just sack whenever you want to. Doesn't matter, pay red mana, sack it. Rotisserie Elemental, you can't use that ability until you hit your opponent for combat damage. So I'm afraid what's gonna happen with this card is you play it early, use mana, it's getting a couple of hits, and then it's gonna get stonewalled, and you're never gonna be able to actually get in that last attack to be able to sacrifice it and get the cards. So when I add all this together, it looks like a bonded courier, but I just don't think it's actually gonna be good enough. That said, there is one thing I do wanna do with this card, which is try to proliferate it. So we've played a little bit of red plurifly in standard. We got stuff like Cacophony Scomp, which works with it, Volt Charge, Staff of Completion. So maybe the way we can play this card in standard is you only try to get in that one hit with it, and then you proliferate and get a bunch of counters, but then you still gotta get in that last hit. So you gotta make it unblockable somehow or something. So even in the proliferate shell, the fact that it only triggers when you deal combat damage actually makes me pretty skeptical that this card's going to be good enough. We've seen some really good red aggro cards today. Sadly, a rotisserie elemental. I don't think it's one of them. What a weird day for red cards. We keep going back and forth from like red staples, bombs, awesome, best cards in the deck in standard to like horrible, horrible mice that no one would ever play. Worst bomb at courier ever. We got another pretty good one though, I think, in red cap gutter dweller. So four mana, three, three, goblin warrior with menace. When it enters the battlefield, you make two one, one black rat creature tokens with these creatures can't block. And then the beginning of your upkeep, you can sack another creature. If you do, you put a counter on it and then you exile the top card of your library you can play that card this turn so before we talk about the magic implications of this card let me make sure i have the flavor of this card right so if i'm understanding this right this guy's a messy cheese eater that's definitely a big hunk of cheese in his hand and he eats it messily drops the cheese that attracts the rats and then he kills the rats is that's what's going on honestly it's it's kind of like always sunny it's like charlie from always sunny with the the rat stick and the love of cheese i'm pretty sure a top-down design of charlie from always sunny but anyway magic wise i think this card actually might be good like it's a hill giant but it gets menace it makes two other bodies which kind of makes it like a siege game commander yes those bodies aren't very good but you don't need them to be very good the rats are kind of like kind of like decay zombies as creatures they're not very exciting but if you're using them for other purposes they actually become pretty powerful and red cap gutter dweller is another purpose like those rats maybe you can never attack with them you can obviously never block with them but you can sack them the next two turns it'll grow this into a five five menace and draw you two cards that by itself it's like a self-contained little 
engine of card advantage. Uh, plus, it's card draw that doesn't get got by Shieldred, and actually after two turns, this can swing by Shieldred, thanks to Menace. You might even be able to swing by it earlier. And there's lots of other synergies just for having these useless rat bodies on the battlefield. Beseech the Mirror, Realm Scorcher, Hellkite, Back for Seconds, any sort of bargaining the rats are perfect for. Back for Seconds really synergizes with this, because you can like play this, get the rats. Once it dies, you can sack the rats, get back the red cap cutter, get more rats. And remember too, I kind of forgot about this. We saw the casualty mechanic in standard and the casualty mechanic kind of works well with bargain. It wants kind of the same thing. If you can make some tokens to sacrifice to like obnixilis or whatever. So I feel like there's enough synergies that this card could actually be really good. Could also be a rat card or though the more we see of this set, the less convinced I become that there's going to be actual like rat tribal in standard. I think the cards that make rats are going to be good because the tokens are just so synergistic in the format, but I'd be surprised if we actually saw like jam all the rats together. And even if we did the fact that red cap gutter dweller is a goblin cheese eating goblin warrior, rather than an actual rat means it doesn't work with Kermonix, which is a downside. But I think red cap gutter dweller is actually just like a pretty good standard card that generates a lot of value, does a lot of good things, synergizes well with a lot of powerful mechanics. So I actually think this card has a chance to be pretty decent in standard. In the world of lower rarity cards, we got a handful that are deserving of a mention, starting with Fairy Fencing. So black and X instant, target creature gets negative X, negative X until end of turn. It gets an additional negative three, negative three, if you control the fairy as you cast this spell. So Fairy Fencing, if you don't have a fairy, Stone unplayable, not a good card. Please don't do it. It's not going to be worth it. On the other hand, this reminds me a little bit of Siphon Ego, where if you do have a fairy, then this actually becomes pretty far above the curve. It's a single mana to give a creature negative three, negative three instant speed. That is great. That means for three mana, you're killing Shieldred. Uh, so I think in a fairy deck, this could be a staple of or removal spell. We'll have to wait and see. Just like Siphon Ego, like, are we going to have a deck that's going to have fairies on the battlefield early enough? And consistently enough to make these spells work that's going to be the question but if you're a fairy deck i think this card is worth keeping in mind and maybe it could show up in fairies in older formats we've talked before during spoiler season about how fairies in a format like modern really values playing at instant speed that's kind of the whole gimmick of the deck to play at instant speed this is an instant and negative three negative three for one mana does kill a lot of really popular threats Still, it's not really a turn one play, so if your opponent just, like, you're on the draw and they play turn one Raghavan, this is not going to be a way to deal with it, which is a problem compared to something like Fatal Push, but we'll have to wait and see. But at least for standard, if Fairy Tribal is a thing, Fairy Fencing seems like it should play a role. We also got Knight of Sweets Revenge, which looks like a meme, but I actually think this card might be kind of busted. So, four mana green enchantment. When it enters a battlefield, make a food token. Most importantly, food you control have tap to add a green mana, and then you can pay seven, sacrifice it. Creatures you control get plus X plus X until end of turn. Rex's number of food you control activate only as a sorcery. So this looks like some weird meme green enchantment. It's got a really joking name Knight of Sweets Revenge but when you think about what this card is I think it's actually kind of absurd because making food tokens is really easy and one card that is super impressed me is to hear a friend of the forest to hear the friend of the forest is this legend this is tokens you control have tapped at a green mana Knight of Sweets Revenge is kind of the same thing it only works for food but it has the upside of being an enchantment so it doesn't die to creature removal it makes a food itself so this is kind of three mana you play it for four but you get the food that can immediately tap for a green and then it's also potentially a finisher for playing a bunch of food so i think at a minimum this is going to be an absurd bomb in any food themed commander deck gnome or sam or farmer cotton rocco tree beard if your deck is built around making a bunch of food this card is absurd so huge upgrade for a lot of lord of the rings commander decks but i think this card could actually work in standard at least i'm gonna try to make it work we really gotta see the rest of the wilds of eldorain set to see just how good the food archetype is because heading into wilds of eldorain we got a single food card and it's rocco from aftermath and it gives your opponent's food and there's like a group hug thing not very good but if we get enough support to make food good i think knight of sweets revenge might actually just straight up be like a standard staple for the archetype we already have like tough cookie which is a food and also makes a food so that's like 
almost a burning tree emissary i guess it doesn't have haste so you can't tap it right away but technically it's two mana and you get two mana if you can tap your food for mana the goose mother can make a ton of food we got greta return to the wilds actually becomes pretty exciting if your food are making mana you get a basic land on the battlefield and a food that's making mana so you turn into kind of like a cultivator or something for three mana legal and standard so if there's a food deck keep this card in mind i know it looks like a meme but i can't shake the feeling that this card is actually like secretly busted in the food deck just because making food is really easy and if all your food is tapping to make a mana the card becomes kind of ridiculous we also got two headed hunter so this is a card that i probably shouldn't be excited about but i kind of am so it's a red uncommon adventure creature it's creature side kind of horrible uh, five mana five forward menace the exciting part is twice the rage the adventure side one in a red instant target creature gains double strike until end of turn so that's essentially the going rate right to give something double strike at instant speed two mana is kind of what you pay for it and this card reminds me a little bit of callous cell sword that we talked about yesterday the the thud essentially adventure so if you're in the market for giving your creature double strike at instant speed the upside of two-headed hunter is that in your deck it's a creature so if you have any sort of like creature tutors or anything you can find it so again this is like a narrow set of circumstances but if you want a double strike spell but your deck can't tutor up spells but it can tutor up creatures then this actually becomes kind of an interesting effect like Eladrami's call two mana grab this two more mana cast this that's like a surprise kill out of nowhere if you got a big creature on the battlefield so that's what makes me excited about the card uh, the creature side really really bad most decks are not going to care about this but there's certain narrow situations where I could see this card actually being very strong we also got discerning finance here which is a card I want your opinion about for commander so three mana two three human nobles says the beginning of your upkeep if if an opponent controls more lands than you create a treasure token and then pay three choose another player that player gains control of a treasure you control and you get to draw a card so discerning financier in a white deck that's based around catch up ramp and being behind on the battlefield is theoretically a three drop that every turn is going to make a treasure token and then you get the extra upside that you can give that token away or a token away to draw a card is that worth it is this a three mana mana rock on a creature is that even good enough does the card draw mode matter my instinct is it's probably not very good although white has gotten pretty good at making treasures it's got stuff like smothering tide so i guess there could be a world where in the late game you like have a bunch of treasures and play this and give several away to draw a bunch of cards so i don't know i lean towards this being like a budget level replacement card for commander i'm just not super hyped about one extra mana per turn and that's not even i guess guaranteed like it's pretty likely in the decks that would play this you're going to be behind on lands against someone if you're playing mono white and commander uh, but it's not a guarantee so ah, i don't know maybe i'm underrating it i've seen people talking about it i lean towards this being like not great but i could see a world where you could argue this was a playable ram spelling commander of course like always we also got a bunch of just kind of draft chaff filler stuff but man check it all out over at mtdpreviews.com finally today for our enchanted tales kind of a late day honestly we got the uncommon impact tremors which eh, it does fill a role and serve purposes in some commander decks just dealing a damage whenever a creature comes into play to each opponent in perforo style decks like can actually be a good card and it does have sweet art and then the big hitter is omniscience which isn't the most ridiculously high-end card but the anime art actually looks pretty sweet and actually both of the arts look pretty sweet so if you want a spicy omniscience for your deck eh, you're gonna get a new option in wilds of eldraine anyway that brings us to the end of our daily wilds of eldorade spoilers for today so what do you think what do you hype for let me know in the comments thanks for watching everyone i hope you enjoyed it and i'll be back tomorrow with more wilds of eldorade spoilers so until then have an amazing day and i will talk to you soon looking for even more magic well you can check out yesterday's spoiler video here or maybe the video where we talked about the plays that actually forced wizards to change the very rules of magic